This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Funded in part by HSS. Our value principles are patient first and we want to deliver the highest quality care. The goal of creating and sustaining value is all about putting the patient at the center of the equation. The purpose of this organization is to help people get back to what they need and love to do. Creeping higher. If you're nervous over mortgage rates hitting levels not seen since 2014, there is a way to lower yours. Going private, President-elect Trump hints at the idea of privatizing the VA, the challenges facing that idea. And on second thought, the growing concern over using email. All that and more on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, December 29th. And good evening, everyone. I'm Contessa Brewer, in for Sue Herrera. And I'm Bill Griffith, in for Tyler Matheson. History is made. We're finally anchoring together. It's about time they've kept us apart all these years. I agree. You know, since the election, mortgage rates have been on the rise, and after the Federal Reserve raised interest rates a few weeks ago, there was no reason to believe that anything would change in that regard. Well, now, according to mortgage buyer Freddie Mac, a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage has ticked up to 4.32 percent. That is the highest level we've seen since April of 2014. And considering that the average for all of 2016 for the 30-year was 3.66 percent, that was the lowest since Freddie Mac began keeping records 45 years ago. That's quite a spike in just two short months. So if you're thinking of buying and you're nervous about high rates, Diana Olick tells us tonight that there is a way to get a lower number. Mortgage rates took a big jump after the presidential election and just kept on going. So if you were in the market to buy a home last summer, but you just couldn't pull the trigger, well, it's going to cost you more now on the monthly payment for the same priced home. Already we've seen the hit from rising rates. Pending home sales dropped in November to the lowest level in almost a year and were lower than November of 2015. Pending sales measure contracts signed, not closings, so people out shopping in November, factoring in those higher rates. The average rate on the 30-year fixed is now well over 4%, and while it has been moving in a narrow range the last few weeks, the expectation is that it will move higher next year as the economy strengthens. Add even faster rising home prices to the mix, and you have something of a toxic cocktail for housing in 2017. But there is an antidote. You can buy down your mortgage rate. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Yes, you have to have more cash up front, but lenders will lower the rate if you pay a percentage of the loan in fees up front. It's called points. One point is 1% 1 of your loan amount. If you were getting a 30 year fixed loan of $300,000, you might get a rate of four and a quarter percent. But if you pay one point or $3,000, you might get a rate of 4%. Lowering your rate by a quarter point lowers your payment by $44 a month and lowers your interest cost by about $62 a month. Important though, this is only a savings if you stay in your house for at least seven years. That way you're saving more than you paid up front. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. That's a real commitment to your home. Let's turn to Darren Bloomquist now to talk more about the U.S. housing market and what he's expecting in the new year. He's the vice president of Realty Track. It's great to see you today, Darren. So set the scene Thanks for us me. a little bit. What do these rising mortgage rates really tell you about the housing market? Well, they tell us that it's time for the housing market to stand on its own two feet and not have kind of some of the artificial supports we've seen over the last few years that have, that have helped the housing market recover and recover more quickly, I think, than a lot of people anticipated. But the housing market is ready, really, to, to not necessarily have those artificial supports. One of those is, is low interest rates. And I think the housing market it is ready, the, the fundamentals are strong, to, uh, to, 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 to recover on its own without uh, those record right. low interest rates. You know, one of the headwinds that, it, I mean, it, low rates helped, but you had lending standards that were so stringent for the last several years that many people didn't qualify for a mortgage otherwise. Has that relaxed enough to let people back into this market again? You know, I, I think it's it's slowly but surely relaxing, but of course we don't want it to relax too much because we'll repeat the mistakes we saw last time around. What we don't want to say is we need to give access to credit so much so 
that we loosen lending standards to the extent that we saw 10 years ago. I, I do think that the rising interest rates is actually going to be a good thing because we're seeing some markets, a, a growing number of markets, hitting these affordability ceilings. Uh, and it's a concern that these markets are becoming overheated. And so rising interest rates will have a cooling effect. And you know, we referenced that the last time we saw this high of an interest rate, even though it's still only 4 percent, 4.32 percent, was back in April of 2014. So we did see a, a chilling effect on the housing market back then when interest rates went up. Right. And I think we'll see that again, but it, I, I consider that actually a good thing to keep these markets from becoming too overheated. You mentioned markets that are hitting an affordability ceiling. Can you be more specific? What cities are you looking at? Yeah, it's, it's the ones that uh, I think a lot of people maybe know, but top of the list is, is Kings County, New York, which is Brooklyn. That's the least affordable in the country. Many counties in the San Francisco area, uh, along with Portland. Some of the surprising areas that, that are becoming less affordable than their historical norms are places like Denver, as well as Dallas and Austin, Texas, more in the middle of the country. They didn't get hit as much by the housing boom last time around, but they really are seeing that uh, this time around. <clears throat> Darren Blomquist, it's great to have you with us today from Realty Track. Thanks. Thank you. A quiet day on Wall Street. Light trading as stocks ended the day relatively flat. The Dow fell just 13 points. We're at 19,819 now. The Nasdaq fell by six, and the S&P was off just a fraction today. All right, let's talk oil now, where Reuters reports shale drillers are ready to spend on exploration and production as banks extend credit lines for the first time in two years. Refiners in Louisiana and Texas last week processed the most crude in nearly a quarter of a century as strong demand from Mexico and the Caribbean grew. Today, domestic crude closed just under $54 a barrel. Starting as early as next week, even more crude could hit the market when sales of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve could begin. Jackie DeAngelis has more. When it comes to crude oil, it's all about supply and demand. And with the recent U.S. shale boom, that balance has been off, causing big swings in the price of oil. Crude saw a low this year of near $26 a barrel, but has found some footing now, over $50. And with increased production at home, the federal government doesn't need to hold on to as much oil in its strategic petroleum reserve. Congress approved selling some of the reserves in its most recent budget resolution. The sales could start as early as January. The SPR has been in place since the late 70s in the wake of the Arab oil embargo. The goal, to keep enough crude on hand to supply the U.S. in case of a major emergency, like Hurricane Katrina or the Arab Spring. But the world has changed. The SBR isn't as important uh, to the U.S. as it was, say, even 15 years ago. And the reason being, number one being the shale play. With uh, shale production of crude oil, you're able to get to crude oil a lot more easily than you were before. Number two is that we're actually moving away from crude oil as far as, as using it to, to power our world. There's a lot more alternatives out in the world. The SPR is roughly 700 million barrels. That's estimated to be enough oil for about a month of U.S. demand. Only about 30% of that would be sold, potentially over the next decade. So it wouldn't be a total abandonment, but a slow drawdown. Still, it could impact crude prices. The U.S. plans on selling, I believe, about 200 million barrels of crude oil uh, from the SPR. And while that does sound like a lot, when you look at the global supply and what trades in crude oil per day, it's not really that much. In fact, if they do it over a period of time, the crude oil market won't even realize it. It won't even be a blip on the radar. The other big variable in the new year? OPEC. Will it follow through with the 1.8 million barrel production cut that it promised in January? And then there's President-elect Donald Trump. Will his energy department go through with this sale? For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. Elsewhere, following yesterday's news that Sprint will hire 5,000 U.S. workers, President-elect Trump posted this on Instagram today. He said, my administration will follow two simple rules, buy American and hire American. And another company in yesterday's announcement also said that it will create 3,000 jobs. That company is called OneWeb, and that left many people saying, who? Josh Lipton tells us. There are still billions of people all around the world that do not have access to the Internet. A startup aims to change that. OneWeb is a company based in Arlington, Virginia, that wants to build a massive network of 900 satellites. 
from 750 miles above the earth, they will deliver high-speed internet service in rural and emerging markets. Greg Weiler, the founder of OneWeb, talked this morning about his company's mission. We're building an incredibly new and ambitious system. We'll be providing internet access initially to almost 10 million uh, uh, residential households. We'll be doing enterprise. We'll be providing uh, internet access to, every, uh, to aircraft and to ships all around the world. So this is a fairly complex system, but we've found uh, a great knowledge base here in the U.S., and, uh, and we do a lot of work also in other countries, but the U.S. has been fantastic. Weiler will now be hiring 3,000 more people over the next four years tripling the size of his current workforce. He says the first prototypes should launch next year and the service will formally launch in 2019. OneWeb's dream of connecting the world is actually an old one. Some 20 years ago, for example, Bill Gates was among those backing a $9 billion plan to connect the world with satellites. That company was called Teledesic. It boasted a grand goal, 840 satellites circling the Earth. But ultimately, just one satellite actually launched and the venture failed. Weiler says this time is different, that the technology is now both powerful and affordable enough to make this dream into a reality. He's certainly attracted a lot of support. OneWeb has raised $1.7 billion from investors. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton, San Francisco. Well, Donald Trump is also reportedly thinking about privatizing the Department of Veterans Affairs. Dina Gazofsky has reported extensively on the VA. She joins us now. Okay, so why, Dina, the push to privatize it in the first place? What's the point? Well, a lot of um, parts of the Department of Veterans Affairs, and this is something officials have said and our reporting has indicated, are overwhelmed. And there are a number of reasons for that. The department is now tasked with taking care of America's Vietnam veterans who are now, of course, getting much older and much sicker, as well as the servicemen and women who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. So that's one. The other major issue, the sort of rampant bureaucracy that is a part of the Department of Veterans Affairs, where it is very difficult to fire an employee, no matter uh, how much investigation they've been under right. or how much wrongdoing they've done, it is just very difficult to fire them. So you did hear the president-elect on the campaign trail and even now speaking about uh, giving more power to the secretary of the VA to be able to fire these employees, but it, it is much easier said than done. There are processes already in place, like appeals and other things that make it extremely difficult. Most of the time, they're just shuffled around to different hospitals or in, in different uh, states, but with the same position. What about the issue of private care? What are the challenges there providing that for VA? Well, I just want to put the VA in context, right? This is the second largest federal agency in terms of funding. The president has asked for $182 billion in 2017. There are thousands of outpatient facilities across the country, hundreds of hospitals. So again, this whole issue of it's a lot easier said than done. Right. In 2014, there was a major scandal where employees were charged with changing patient wait time, so making it seem like patients weren't waiting as long as they actually were. And at that point, Congress passed the Veterans Access Choice and Accountability Act, which said that if you're a veteran who can't get an appointment within 30 days, or if you're a veteran who lives uh, 40 miles away or more than 40 miles away from the closest facility, you can get private care. Now, the difference with uh, President-elect Trump's plan is that there are no stipulations there. It just says we want veterans to be able to get the private care, but it doesn't have those sort of riders attached to it. No doubt that if this proposal were to become a solid and concrete avenue, you would have a lot of pushback from people who look at the privatization of prisons, the privatization of the war effort, and say, look, it, it hasn't been without major problems in the past. That being said, whoever is in charge of the VA would have a big hand in it. Who might that be? And you're absolutely right, and I just want to bounce back on that point. A lot of veteran service organizations are against privatization, and they're actually encouraging the president-elect to stay with the current Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Bob McDonald. Uh, on the short list is the chairman of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, who's actually retiring, Jeff Miller. He helped craft uh, Trump's 10-point plan, um, as well as the Cleveland Clinic CEO. So it'll be interesting to see who gets the job. Very good. See Dean Kosofsky, thanks. See you later. Coming up, our market monitor has three companies that he thinks could thrive under a Trump administration. I'll tell you what they are coming up.
Honda is recalling nearly 650,000 Odyssey minivans because the second row of seats might not lock and could shift suddenly during a crash. The recall covers 2011 through 2016 models. So far, no related injuries have been reported. The FDA turns down Sempra's pneumonia drug, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The regulatory agency rejected the biotech's antibiotic for community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, citing manufacturing issues and a lack of sufficient data supporting the treatment's safety. Sempra said that it plans to request a meeting with the FDA to address those concerns. Sempra shares plunged by 57 percent plus today to $2.60. And as we told you earlier this week, medical device maker Endologix said that it was placing a hold on the shipments of one of its devices due to a manufacturing problem. And today the company said it was resuming those shipments of some of the systems. Following the news, Endologix shares surged by 11 percent, up to $5.92. Sears is reportedly borrowing another $200 million from its chief executive, Edward Lampert. The retailer will receive the funds through a loan provided by affiliates of the CEO's hedge fund. And with consent from the lenders, Sears could expand that amount up to $500 million. Shares of Sears rose 10 percent to $9 even. Mobileye, which develops autonomous driving technology, said it's entered a partnership with intelligent map-making company HERE. Under the agreement, the two companies will combine their real-time road and location software. Mobile eye shares rose nearly 10 percent to $38.44. As we continue our special week of market monitors, our next guest has stock picks that he says could do well under the Trump administration. He is Ross Gerber, president and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki. Nice to see you again, Ross. Thanks. Great to be back. Now, I mean, since the election, the financials, the banks have rallied on the expectation that we're going to see a pullback to some degree on Dodd-Frank and rise in interest rates. You like the banks in part because of that, but you're not picking a lot of the money centers. You like First Republic, for example. Why that mm -hmm. one? Well, that one in particular is a particularly well-run bank. It's in a great part of the nation. It's in Silicon Valley area. They have almost zero loan losses, um, really well-run, and, and actually a decent wealth management division as well. But, but it's all about personalized service and providing multiple services to your customers, and, and that's what First Republic does very well. But the bottom line is we think the big banks are, have all kinds of business practice issues like Wells Fargo, and we don't want to get involved with that because we don't know what those risks are at Bank of America and Citigroup, but we know that they're doing the same practices as Wells Fargo. It's just a matter of time. So by sticking with the regional banks, you take out what I call business risk. All right. So you don't like big banks, but how do you feel about big media companies like, I don't know, Disney? Well, I love Disney, and I think media is in a massive disruption change right now. And in the end, content players are going to come out on top. And Disney has the best content in sports, and they have the best content for kids, and they have the best content in movies. So when you look at that and you say, what's the true value, and you look at the overall multiple of the company versus the market, uh, I think Disney is a very unique opportunity. But, but what right about now. ESPN? Is that a drag? No, not at all. In fact, as we go into the bowl games this weekend, uh, ESPN is an asset like no other. And I think people's fears about ESPN are way overblown. In fact, sports content is more sought after, more desirable by advertisers than ever before. You like MGM and the casino plays there. Why does that necessarily do well under a Trump administration necessarily? Well, first of all, Trump has a lot of incentive to see Vegas do well because he has a large asset there. But we see Trump being very good for things like regulation. So we think that we'll see an end to a ban on sports betting, for example, which would be a boon for the casinos. We also see more dollars in people's pockets because of tax cuts and other economic uh, things he's doing to spur the economy, which will then ultimately go to Las Vegas. And we also see corporate tax cuts really helping a domestic-based company like like MGM, which basically just puts money in their bottom line. So we really see them winning in many ways right now. Three picks for 2017 from Ross Gerber of Gerber Kawasaki. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. Great to be on. Coming up, why more and more business leaders are thinking twice before hitting the send button.
The Obama administration issued new sanctions against Russia in part over allegations the country hacked Democratic officials and tried to interfere with the presidential election in the United States. And now the U.S. has expelled 35 Russian diplomats and shut down two Russian compounds used for what the administration called intelligence-related purposes. Russia says it will consider retaliatory measures. And with all the talk of hacking these days and our reliance on email, many Americans, including business leaders, are becoming more and more wary about using the online communication. Andrea Day takes a look for us tonight. I was getting two to 400 emails a day, and it just became a huge distraction. He's the CEO of Tommy John, the underwear company on pace to exceed 100 million in annual sales by 2018. But if you need to reach Tom Patterson, don't send him an email. I no longer check emails between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. If you need to get a hold of me during that time, send me a text message or stand up and walk over to me. His strategy started long before WikiLeaks began dripping out secret information. It was a scare at his first job out of college that made him rethink email forever. A girl I worked with started screaming like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And she sent an email and said something she regretted. I just sat next to her and I'm like, gosh, I never want to have that feeling. And according to experts, Patterson had it right from the get-go. Best-selling author Jocelyn Gly's book, Unsubscribe, is about the benefits of cutting back on email. I think that we've had this feeling of safety and security with email for a really long time, which and now that bubble is really being burst. Burst, she says, after WikiLeaks released batches of hacked emails from inside Hillary Clinton's campaign, infecting some Americans with email anxiety. It made me feel as a citizen that perhaps we're more vulnerable. I'm thinking about looking at that software that encrypts your email. I've always been very concerned about where my emails might end up. Like Patterson, many well-known business leaders use email sparingly, if at all. J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon reportedly keeps his email replies short, sometimes down to one word. Investor Carl Icahn rarely uses the service, and Warren Buffett relies on an assistant for his messages. Everything can be exposed publicly eventually, and we need to take that attitude towards it. And beyond security, Patterson says he's already seen an impact. Is it really empowered the people reporting to me to be more direct? I was able to delegate responsibilities. And Gly says if you have any doubt at all, don't send out the email. Come back to it later and then decide. Or better yet, have a face-to-face -face conversation, especially if it's something confidential. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Andrea Day. Well, it's a good bet that cybersecurity companies will try to line up money to go public as the drumbeat to secure cyberspace grows louder. But what other tech companies are heading the list for potential public offerings in 2017? Deirdre Bozet takes a look. 2016 was a very slow year for tech companies to go public. Many startups tapped the private markets for funding, but there were just 14 initial public offerings, continuing a recent trend. The 14 IPOs were half the number in 2015 and just a fraction from 2014. Some of the reasons? Uncertainty around the presidential election and an emphasis on profitability over growth likely put a lid on companies wanting to go public. But venture capitalist Kate Mitchell says that next year's market conditions will bode well for the tech IPO pipeline public companies, uh, big private companies ready to go. Um, there'll be a question of whether or not that's at or above their last uh, private valuation. But I think in terms of public market demand, it should be strong. CB Insights is also anticipating a busier 2017 for tech IPOs. Using its mosaic rating system that analyzes the strength and rank of privately held companies, it came up with the five strongest IPO candidates next year. They include meal delivery startup Blue Apron, enterprise software company Zora, and education technology platform Pluralsight. Some of the hottest names in the startup world, like Airbnb and Pinterest, may not be top candidates, but analysts say they could be looking to tap the public market soon. Travis Kalanick, CEO and co-founder of Uber, the world's most highly valued startup, has previously said that he wanted to wait as long as possible to go public. But Mitchell says, don't be surprised if that happens sooner than some think. Mark Zuckerberg himself said he didn't know why he waited so long. Um, it actually allowed him to do a lot more uh, with his currency uh, post-IPO than he was even able to do pre-IPO. So I, I, I hear that and I don't quite get that. 
But the hottest startup to watch when 2017 kicks off is Snap, parent of mobile messaging app Snapchat. It's reportedly filed paperwork to go public and raised as much as $4 billion in a deal that would value the company at around $20 to $25 billion. It could be the big debut that snaps the IPO market out of its doldrums, or it could disappoint hopes for a revival. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Deirdre Boza, Vancouver, Canada. If only us oldsters could figure it out. I just don't get Snapchat, whatever that is. <laughs> That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Contessa Brewer. Thank you for watching. What do you say we do this again tomorrow? Okay, let's do it. You got it. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. We will see you again here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... Our value principles are patient first, and we want to deliver the highest quality care. The goal of creating and sustaining value is all about putting the patient at the center of the equation. The purpose of this organization is to help people get back to what they need and love to do.